Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, lecture on world deserts. So I'm going to talk about deserts for a while and uh, we'll identify deserts in the world and then talk about uh, more specifically deserts uh, in our local Arizona state and uh, Sonoran deserts. So we'll look at uh, a definition of deserts and then we'll talk about different deserts all over the world. I'll just mention those and then talk specifically about the Sonoran Desert and then threats to the Sonoran Desert. So first of all, um, you got a quiz. So I'd like for you to just think about each of these and whether or not you would say, yes, they are a desert or no, that is not a desert. So look at these, each of these pictures. I'm thinking that you will probably recognize the deserts, uh, the pictures on the right, probably the, the top and the bottom of, of definitely being a desert. Um, and then you probably say the one on the left, the upper left is probably not a desert. But I've actually had some people think, well, the ones in the middle, maybe they're deserts because they're, uh, they're desolate and you don't see any people or buildings or, or roads and those kinds of things. But we'll talk about a definition of desert. Um, so I take offense to some of those being called deserts because that's the one in the middle, uh, the upper middle is where I grew up and so I call that a short grass prairie. And then uh, some people wouldn't recognize the one in the middle on the far right as a desert because it's, it's nice, it's Antarctica. So let's, let's look at some definitions. Let's look at the, the, some of the agreed to definitions from ecologists. Uh, around the world. So uh, it seems to be pretty well agreed that areas that average less than 10 inches of precipitation a year would be called a desert. Or another definition would be if they had slightly over 10 inches of precipitation but the areas, uh, their annual potential evaporation is two times greater than the precipitation. So if they got 20 inches of precip, uh, they may have a potential for uh, 40 or so inches of precip uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, in this area, we have a potential for over 100 inches uh, of evaporation or evapotranspiration. That's because the humidity is really low, uh, it's really hot, and uh, the majority of the days during the, um, the, during the year are, are sunshiny and, and warm days. So the potential for evaporation is very high. Well, in any case, one common theme of deserts is aridity. So it's dry and uh, not necessarily hot. It can, be, uh, it can also be cold. For example, in the previous slide, uh, Antarctica is considered to be a desert because it receives less than 10 inches of precip a year. Uh, but it's very cold, so it doesn't evaporate very fast. Okay, so uh, deserts are important to us because about one-fifth of the earth is covered with desert, of the, um, of the lands on earth at least are, are covered by desert. So there are 14 major deserts and uh, you can see on the, the slide that there's a list of the, um, the more famous deserts in North America. I'll break those down in a second, but uh, we just call them North American deserts. Um, for now and then uh, of course you've heard of the Sahara Desert probably and the Arabian Desert, the Thar, the Turkestan, uh, the Gobi Desert you've probably heard of and then there's deserts in Australia, uh, the Calamari Desert, Namib Desert and then Patagonian and Atacama. So I'll talk about some of those. Probably won't talk very much about um, uh, most of the deserts in the world other than uh, those deserts in the in the U.S. or in North America. So you might hear the um, the phrase, or you might have noticed on the globe that the deserts are located um, close, fairly close to the equator, but really not right on the equator. They're 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south of the equator. Uh, sometimes those are referred to as horse horse latitudes. And I'll go back and explain where that that um, idea came from in just a second, but that location is uh, 30 degrees north, it's the Tropic of uh, Cancer north of the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn south of the equator. 
And the reason they're located there is because of the way uh, air moves from the equator. So we know that uh, the equator is where the sun's rays are most intense. So that's where most of the energy directly strikes the earth is right on the equator. And you say, well, then why isn't it hotter and drier on the equator? And that's because when the sun's rays hit the equator, the air rises, and as it rises, it, it cools. It raises up in ele elevation and it cools, and then it moves either north or south. Uh, as it actually, in the process, when it's rising, it gets uh, high enough in elevation, the air condenses, and that's where it rains. So it rains actually close to the equator. And that dry air moves north or it moves south, and uh, when it gets to about 30 degrees, uh, that cold, warm air starts to decline, and as it declines, it gets back down to the earth and moves south again. And then there's another, these are called Hadley cells, this, this pattern that the air takes. So right at the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn is where those two Hadley cells meet, and they're actually absorbing moisture from the soil rather than uh, precipitation taking place and supplying water to the soil. So those are the driest, overall the driest spots on Earth. So I said I was going to talk about horse latitudes and why they call it a horse latitude. So there's a couple of um, stories about that and uh, I choose to believe one of them and maybe the other one too is, is true. But uh, the first one is that uh, seamen, when they were uh, people were sailing uh, you know, from Europe, other countries, to the New World, to North America, um, they would, the, sh the seamen, the, the shipmen would um, they get paid part of their salary in the beginning, uh, just just a small portion of their salary, and uh, so they would borrow money from the uh, the paymaster, I guess you would call them on the ship. This is the story anyway. So they'd borrow the money, and then uh, they would spend all of their time during uh, their voyage to paying working to pay the money back. And so uh, the story is that when they got close to this area between the uh, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, uh, they finally paid their debt back and they would celebrate uh, with a horse as effigy uh, parading around the ship. And when they finally paid the money back on that day when they were celebrating, they threw the, horse, threw the horses overboard. The other story is, which this one might be more true. Uh, again, when they were uh, from Europe, when um, ships were going to North America, they were um, they would take livestock, they take especially horses uh, overseas, and then when they uh, were on their way back, or even to the way on their way to North America, sometimes they would get in this zone where there's not as much wind. Uh, the, the seas are more calm, and so it's taken a lot longer for them to get where they're going, so they start to run out of water. And so they start to run out of water for their horses, and so you, know, you probably imagine the rest of the story. The horses go over the overboard, not the humans. So that's the other story. Anyway, to get back to deserts, um, these are considered to be very fragile ecosystems since they don't get very much rain. There's not very much plant production and um, there's a lot of evapotranspiration. Okay, so uh, I'll ask a question again. You think about this in your mind. What's the largest desert? And this is a hint. It's really cold, lots of snow. It's the Antarctic is the largest desert. Again, it's, it's not a hot desert. It's a cold desert, but you know, it gets less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. There's 5.4 million square miles of the Antarctic. So that's the largest desert. And uh, what's the largest non-polar desert, or maybe I could say the ha largest hot desert? You would probably say um, the Sahara. And uh, so that's, that's correct. It's 3,500,000 square miles, the Sahara Desert. Okay. Um, so then, what is the driest desert? There's actually some controversy over that because there's a couple of deserts that are really dry. The Gobi Desert is really dry. Well, and there are several of the hot deserts that are really dry. But we're going to say that the Atacama Desert in Chile is the driest. Precipitation is 0.02 inches per year. Um, 
So the Atacama Desert has two of these uh, conditions, phenomena that take place that cause it to be dry. One of them that it's, it's right at that first Hadley cell um, where the two Hadley cells meet together, so right at the, the Tropic of Capricorn uh, in the southern hemisphere. So that's one of the reasons it's dry. And then it also has a mountain range along the coast uh, that prevents the moist air from the Pacific Ocean uh, from supplying air to, or supplying moisture to the Atacama Desert. So when, uh, when this moist air from the Pacific Coast uh, reaches the coast along the Atacama Desert in uh, South America, Chile, it reaches the mountain range and then to go over the mountain range, of course, it has to elevate. So it gets a higher, this moist air increases in elevation and as it increases in elevation, it becomes more dense and it becomes dense enough that it, precipitation occurs on that windward side. So it, it dumps all of its moisture on the windward side, on the side that the ocean is on. And as it goes over the mountain, then it's really dry. And so as it goes over the mountain toward the east, uh, it not, it's not only dry and fails to supply moisture, it actually starts to absorb the moisture that's there in the Atacama Desert. So, so it, gets, um, it gets really dry in the Atacama Desert. Okay, uh, the world's hottest desert. This one is probably the Sahara again. Of course, there's some controversy with that, but 136 degrees Fahrenheit is recorded on uh, the Sahara Desert. Okay, so uh, the North American deserts. Let's talk about those and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the Sonoran Desert than the other deserts. Um, but ecologists generally recognize four deserts in North America and uh, collectively they comprise the largest regions as far as desert regions in uh, North America. So I'll back up just a second here. Uh, so the deserts are uh, the Great Basin Desert, the Mojave Desert, the Sonoran Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, and uh, I'll talk about each one of those individually a little bit. The Great Basin Desert is a cold desert also, not as cold as the Antarctic, but uh, it is a cold desert. There's uh, a significant amount of precipitation is during the winter months. Most of the precipitation is during the winter months, and uh, they get uh, some snow. It's the largest North American desert at 190,000 square miles. It's, so when we say rain shadow desert, uh, it's, um, it's blocked from uh, precipitation on both sides by uh, the Sierra Nevadas on the west side and then eventually the Rocky Mountains, uh, I'm sorry, the Sierra Nevadas on, on the desert's west side and then the, the Rocky Mountains on its east side. So it gets the uh, rain shadow effect by the Sierra Nevadas. The uh, moisture coming from the Pacific uh, is basically shadowed or uh, it leaves its rain behind on the leeward side of the mountains. Or I'm sorry, the windward side of the mountains and then on the leeward side it's, it's dry. Okay, so anyway, um, the, the plants that grow predominantly there or that you think about that characterize the Great Basin Desert are uh, the smaller shrubs, uh, the sagebrush, the artemisia species, um, some of the salt, salt bushes, atriplex, atriplex canescens, atriplex gardneri, some of those species are there. And then winter fat, crashing in Alcovia, is um, the winter fat plant, a very, very palatable plant for wildlife. Um, some of the problems that they've had recently with, in the um, Intermountain or the Great, ba Great Basin Desert is uh, plant invasion, especially with the Bromus tectorum, a brom species, uh, uh, an introduced species from um, Europe, and it's an annual grass that's very flammable. So what happens with Bromus tectorum is it's, it's so flammable when lightning strikes, natural fire, or even a uh, person-caused fire starts it really spreads the fire throughout the, um, the Great Basin Desert. And so it burns the, uh, the native species like the, the big sagebrush, the Artemisia. And um, so the fires become more frequent because the, uh, the, it, there's kind of a self-feedback mechanism with the Bromus tectorum growing. It actually grows well after fire also. So it grows back, the Bromus tectorum grows back. So it encourages 
sets up the conditions so that the fires be become more frequent. And if they become more frequent, then it changes the native plant community. And so there's a loss of the uh, big sage and some of those plants. And so the, the other organisms that depend on these plants uh, also uh, suffer and are sometimes become imperiled. So that's the Great Basin Desert. Um, the Chihuahuan Desert is, uh, if you see the map up in, in the upper right hand corner, it's the, the desert shown in kind of a yellow color. It's in the lower right hand corner of that map. So it covers, um, it's mostly down in Mexico. Um, it goes up into Texas and some up into uh, New Mexico. Uh, but the majority of uh, this 175,000 square mile desert is in Mexico. And it's more of a um, desert grassland type. There's more grasses like the Sporobla species, the drop seed grasses that grow there. You'll see Ocotillo that grows there and some of the, some of the plants that we see in the, the Sonoran Desert also grow in the uh, Chihuahuan Desert. Okay, so anyway, it's, it's dominated by shrubs. Creosote is Laria tridentata, uh, white thorn is an acacia, and then uh, tar bush um, is another shrub that grows down, uh, down there. For Florencia serena is the scientific name for that. Um, anyway, uh, that's the Chihuahuan Desert. We'll go to the Mojave Desert, which in North America, the Mojave Desert is the smallest of those deserts. Um, you probably think about the Joshua tree when you uh, go through the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert is mostly located in California, so it's kind of that um, lower uh, east portion of, uh, of California. You can see where there's a small map of the Mojave Desert. The um, Joshua Tree National Park is there, and so uh, you, you, maybe you've gone through that. So um, this is also an area where uh, fire was not part of the long-term evolutionary history, and so they're starting to see problems with fire. Uh, another brome species, Bromus rubens, is a species there that um, is not native, and it's caused an increase in the frequency or an increase in the fire regime in the uh, Mojave Desert. It's dominated also by creosote, Laria tridentata, and then bitterbrush and shad scale, another atroplex spe uh, species. Okay, let's go to the Sonoran Desert. And the Sonoran Desert is what we're used to seeing around um, the Phoenix area, where, where I am now. Um, so it's, it actually straddles uh, the Sea of, sea of Cortez and um, so it goes down uh, Baja, California, and then it's all on the, the Mexican side, also inland. And then all the way up, of course, into uh, southwestern Arizona and southeastern California. The Sonoran Desert has been studied probably more than, or at least as much as any of the other desert, maybe a little bit more. And it was, it, it was divided up into, um, initially it was divided up into seven subdivisions. And uh, so recently the uh, central, uh, I'm sorry, the, the plains of Sonora portion of it has been uh, excluded from the Sonoran Desert. So it just depends on which uh, ecologists you talk to, whether there's, there's still seven subdivisions or not. But these su seven subdivisions were delineated by um, a scientist, ecologist named Forrest Shreve back in 1951. And so those subdivisions are the Arizona Upland subdivision, the Lower Colorado Valley subdivision, the Plains of Samora, Vizcaino, uh, Magdalena Plains, and then Central Gulf Coast subdivisions. And they're pretty different as far as the plant communities go. Uh, so in Arizona, we think of um, the saguaro. In th those areas, we think about the, uh, the Sonoran Desert having saguaro and Palo Verde. And that's really typical of uh, the Arizona upland subdivision. Um, so if I fail to mention uh, 275,000 square kilometers, um, 106,000 square miles of Sonoran Desert, including all those subdivisions. So I'm going to look at each one of those individually, um, starting with the Arizona upland subdivision. 
You see the saguaro and Palo Verde, that's something that characterizes the Arizona upland subdivision of the Sonoran Desert. So this is something that you, you would expect to see in the lower Col Colorado River subdivision of the Sonoran Desert. It's a little bit drier uh, area. Uh, the plant community is a little less diverse. The Arizona upland subdivision is the most diverse of all the um, of all the deserts actually. Uh, many species, many different kinds of plant species and animal species. So the lower, lower Colorado River subdivision is, um, the plant that characterizes it most is Laria tridentata. This is um, creosote bush that you see in this slide. And you see a lot of uh, bare ground, bare interspaces in between. This is typical of the lower Colorado subdivision, lower Colorado River subdivision. The Magdalena Plains uh, subdivision is um, down and in, uh, further in, in Mexico. So the further you go south, you'll see, you'll start to go, get into the Magdalena Plains subdivision. Uh, typical plants are uh, the Oregon pipe cactus is one thing that you'll see. And then you also see a lot of the agave in the center of this picture. You'll see um, an agave plant. And so that's pretty typical of the Mag uh, Magdalena Plains subdivision. And then uh, Vizcaino is one that's on the Baja, uh, occupies most of the Baja, uh, California. And you start to see some of the uh, Fulcariaceae plants, the Bujan tree looking uh, plant in this uh, the upper left hand corner of the slide. And then you also see saguaro and actually some of the Laria tridentata in this uh, in this division also. The plains of Sonora is over on the the mainland Mexico side and you, it start you start to see more grasses and uh, more of the larger shrubs. You also see a lot of the organ pipe cactus and a lot of the agave in that subdivision. And then uh, central Gulf Coast is kind of a mix depending on how uh, where you exactly where you're at as far as distance from the the ocean and how rocky it is, but one thing that's characteristic of it is this cordon cactus that looks like saguaro, uh, a little little different growth form than saguaro. And so that's uh, pretty typical of the central Gulf Coast subdivision. So one thing that uh, is common with all the plant, or the majority of the plants in the Sonoran Desert is that uh, they use a little, a different pathway for photosynthesis. So they're real succulent plants and they, they're able to uh, photosynthesize. They, they can take in the, uh, the light rays from the sun during the day, of course, but they're able to close their stomata during the daytime to prevent evaporation and finish up uh, the photosynthesis process in the Calvin cycle at nighttime. So that's uh, one of those adaptations of these plants that helps them to survive the really hot and dry climate. Okay. So more about the Sonoran Desert and what, uh, what is unique about the Sonoran Desert. Um, it's, it's very diverse. You can see the, the diversity of plant species. It's really a pretty desert. Lots of different plants, lots of succulent plants. Uh, and then of course the Palo Verde and um, saguaro. You can see uh, teddy bear choya, uh, uh, Laria tridentata. And then uh, along with the diversity in plants, you'll see diversity of animals. And this is just a few of the things that you would probably think about, uh, at, you know, the majority of the plants that, that would stand out in your mind if you saw them in the Sonoran Desert. Javelina, desert tortoise, uh, rabbits, uh, the roadrunner, uh, um, desert bighorn, rattlesnakes, and, and uh, even pack rats. Uh, Gila monster and those kinds of species you, you, you'll see as well as many more. Okay, so it's uh, the Sonoran Desert is found of course in Arizona, New Mexico and, and California. Uh, it's the hottest of the North American deserts. Um, precipitation is bi-seasonal which is unique. Uh, we get uh, a monsoon season if you will or a rainy season. Uh, during the summer and then another rainy season during the winter typically. Of course that varies, not, not always. We don't always get, have a rainy season. Uh, but that causes more diversity in plants. Some plants favor 
winter moisture and some plants favor summer moisture. So if you get both of those, then you get that, you just, uh, have a potential for, for a double uh, the amount of plants. Okay, I mentioned already that it's highest as far as biological diversity of all the deserts. 2,500 species of plants have been identified. Uh, it's relatively young as, as far as deserts go. Um, portions are, of the desert are estimated to be only 10,000 years old, and so say, how do we know that? So we know that there's, over geological time, there's been these uh, glacial periods, you may have uh, heard, of, heard them called, and then uh, non-glacial periods or um, interglacial periods. And so we know that over geological time, millions of years, we've had some fluctuations in temperatures. And so as there was these fluctuations in temperatures, there's also a movement of plants. Uh, so the plants that occupy the Sonoran Desert now were really subtropical plants, or they, were, they came from, tropics, the, from, from the tropics. So they were tropical plants, but as the world, as the earth warmed, then these tropical plants started to migrate north over thousands to millions of years, of course. These plants would find more suitable area and start to grow further north where it used to be too cold. They started moving as the earth started to warm up. And then as the earth started to cool down, they started to die off and the, and the plants were basically moved back to the tropics again. <clears throat> well, during that time, of course, there's some of them that genetically adapted and, and adapted these new traits that allowed them to be more tolerant of, of dry conditions and then uh, of cold conditions. So you had, you had a new plant community develop in the Sonoran Desert is what happened over this, these hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So that's why in the Sonoran Desert, the plants that we see now, the saguaro and those, all those native plants are unique. We don't see those same plants in any of the other continents unless they were introduced, of course. Um, so that's one thing that's unique about it. Um, it really kind of a neat, yeah, of course this, um, there's several studies, uh, studies with uh, pollen and studies with uh, uh, peat and studies with tree rings, you know, studying tree rings and, and uh, they could determine what the temperatures were. But also uh, a pretty unique study that was done here by a couple of uh, scientists from the University of Arizona uh, they did some work with pack rats, um, uh, pack rat middens. And so pack rats are one of those, they're really adaptable species. They're here now and they were probably at the same place when the Sonoran Desert was a woodland. And uh, so that's one of the things that they verified. They uh, found these pack rat middens and uh, the ones that were in the caves that had mineralized and over years, because pack rats will go back to their uh, nest, you know, generation after generation, they'll go back to the same nest. And if you know characteristic of pack rats, they'll take whatever is uh, available to them for them to make nests in the adjacent area. So um, Julio Betancourt and uh, Thomas Van Devender uh, did a study and actually wrote a book on their work that they did with pack rat middens. And uh, so they found some middens that were in caves uh, as much as 20, thousand years old. And so they were able to find the actual plant materials that the pack rats took back to their nest 20,000 years ago. They were do, did some uh, carbon uh, 14 dating and, and all. So anyway, the, the uh, plant materials that they found were uh, pine cones and uh, all the, you know, the remnants that you would find in a woodland type vegetation, not a Sonoran Desert type vegetation. So anyway, we know that from um, 10,000 or so years ago that uh, this area was actually a woodland and not a desert, the majority of the area. Okay. So anyway, this is just some things. Uh, Arizona is the only state that contains portions of all four North American deserts. Uh, chrysalis bush is found in three of the hot deserts in North, North America. Um, so chrysalis bush uh, can be uh, a clone, so a, pl a plant that grows off the old root system of other plants, and they found some really old creosote bush plants also. 
Okay, so, so what are some of the threats to the Sonoran Desert? I'll talk about some of that. Um, we know that the face of the Sonoran Desert is changing pretty fast just because of um, the uh, population growth and the, the impacts that it suffers from uh, human populations, so anthropogenic impacts uh, continue to grow as the population grows. Um, so is, this is a figure that might be sort of old, it might even be faster than this, this now, but uh, it, at one time Maricopa County um, was being developed at a rate of one acre of desert per hour on a 24-hour basis. So it was being uh, developed into uh, home sites at a rate of 20, one home, I mean one acre per um, hour over a 24-hour period. So that's pretty fast development. So I have a graph here that shows uh, population growth. So if we started back in the early 1900s, around 50,000 uh, people in the 1950s, maybe around 300,000 till now to about 4.8 uh, 4 million. Uh, so the growth has gone almost an exponential uh, growth curve. I would say it is an exponential growth curve. So the faster it started to grow, uh, then it caused regenerated and caused uh, even faster growth, growing faster each year. Started at the top, it seems like it's slowing down just a little bit, but uh, growth has been very fast in, in Maricopa County. So I used Maricopa County, and really um, the figure that's uh, important is all of the Sonoran Desert, and there has been um, an increase in population in the Sonoran Desert for the last decade that's faster than the national growth rate. So people seem to be moving to the desert instead of moving to more uh, to wetter uh, condition uh, places in the U.S. Okay. So some of the threats are uh, recreation activities with all these people, uh, wildfires. Uh, the Sonoran Desert didn't evolve with uh, a long-term long ecological history of fire. Uh, it couldn't have. The, uh, the, the desert has the types of plants that can't survive in fire, so if fire was was common, then we wouldn't have the plants there that we have now. So, uh, but there is an increase in fires because of the uh, different activities, more introduction of fires in the Sonoran Desert, and more introduction of uh, invasive species like Bromus rubens. Uh, sometimes, uh, in some areas, uh, poor management as far as livestock grazing goes, and then uh, losing public land status. Um, this was, was mostly talking about uh, public lands, and a lot of the public lands back in the uh, early part of the 1900s or even 1950 were being traded. Uh, the, so Forest Service land, for example, was, was traded uh, and the um, desert land was made private in, in exchange for some more public land in the forested areas, which was considered to be more valuable at that time. Okay, so um, talked about that, land exchange. And so you can see urban sprawl is something that's a threat to the desert. Uh, more people having um, a chance to build out in the desert. Uh, there's an opportunity now for utilities and an ability to, to move out into the desert and make their home in the desert. So this is uh, an extreme picture of urban sprawl on the left and then uh, undeveloped desert on the right. Motorized vehicles are a problem if they're not controlled, and then, of course, that's increased with an increased population. You can see this area, it's a lower, lower sycamore, uh, so it's a lower part of the Tonto National Forest, where it's a real popular area for ATVs, and so you can see that that's um, pretty well uh, deteriorating, causing some uh, watershed problems with this hill. And then there's uh, things, vandalism and uh, trash left in the desert it's, uh, uh, is, is an indicator of lots of people getting out into the desert and not respecting the desert. Illegal shooting is something that, that takes place. Uh, recreation shooters, um, sometimes called wildcat shooters, so you can see people just out uh, with their own, in their own area, made their own shooting area and shooting at their uh, the computer that uh, wouldn't start up for them or something like that. So here's one of those areas. This is uh, an example of um, 
some disagreement of the way deserts are used or our national forces are used. This was an earth first um, demonstration that uh, opposed any grazing in the Sonoran Desert. And so there are some emotional ties to the desert and some emotional opinions, I guess, on how we manage the desert as far as uh, livestock grazing goes. And then there's just vandalism. Uh, this is a, a fee area. Some of, the, some of these areas of, uh, um, the, is used for you, uh, planting marijuana and that kind of thing. We've seen that. Um, conflicts with other recreations too. And then range improvements have vandalized. Um, someone had uh, pretty well torn, off, torn up this storage tank for livestock and the uh, windmill was actually pretty well shot up too. <clears throat> so Sonoran Desert fires is something that's a concern um, for the desert, for the desert plants. And Sonoran, as I said before, fires was not, fires really didn't happen that much. You, you, uh, you would see lightning, of course, uh, in the desert at the beginning of the monsoon, year, monsoon season, but uh, desert plants were spaced far enough apart where you hardly ever would expect to see fires uh, get to uh, a very big size at least, so you wouldn't see much destruction of the saguaro and the palo verde and the yocotillo. Uh, but now with uh, an introduction of uh, red brome, bromus rubens, you can actually uh, see quite a bit of damage of fires sometimes. So I'll talk about fire just a little bit. Um, we know that these succulent plants can't uh, withstand fire, they can't tolerate fire, so it it pretty well takes plants like the saguaro out of the plant community. And it takes a saguaro, um, uh, you know, if, for a saguaro to grow about 50 meters in height, uh, not 50 meters, uh, 50 centimeters in height, uh, it takes actually a longer time than you expect. Even for it to grow uh, to one meter in height takes about 50 years. So, you know, if it's not in a, a real wet area or not being irrigated, it takes about 50 years for a saguaro to go one to grow one meter in height. So, if that's the case, then you wouldn't want fire to reoccur in 50 years. It wouldn't have a chance to to mature. The saguaro wouldn't have a chance to mature. So, it's probably for that reason at all, or that indicator at all alone, um, the fact that saguaros grow up to be 250 years old, then you probably would agree that fires probably didn't occur very often in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, um, so we know that fires um, increased uh, pretty sharply from about 1955 to 1980. I have a graph here and it shows uh, an increase of fires to uh, 1980. Really quite a few fires in the 1980s. That was a really wet year, I mean a really wet decade. And so we, we saw quite a few fires in the 1980s and then they started to taper off to, uh, to 2000. A problem is in, from, from 1990 to 2000 is uh, now there were fewer fires but probably larger fires when, the, when it did burn the, the uh, Sonoran Desert fires were probably larger. And I think the numbers tapered off a little bit more because of uh, improved constructions of the highways, so the, the road right of ways are wider and um, also, uh, people just becoming more aware of it and being more careful about not burning, uh, not starting a fire in the Sonoran Desert, putting out their campfires and that kind of thing. So here's uh, a typical scenario as far as fires spreading in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, this is along the, uh, this is actually Highway 60, and uh, this is uh, probably early 1990s, so it's, it's uh, a four-lane road now and uh, with a wider, um, road shoulder. But this is an annual grass that's growing along the side of the road. This is a vena fatua and it's very flammable. So you can imagine if a car comes along pulling a trailer and the uh, safety chain is dragging on the highway, it's probably bouncing some sparks into the uh, vena fatua and, uh, and initiating or uh, igniting um, the fire. So, and that's Exactly, this would be the result. So you'd, so you'd see the fire start from this uh, ignition point and, and then spread into the Sonoran Desert. And this is part of the Rio fire uh, 20 years ago. 
And uh, so in this, this part of the, the Rio fire, uh, it didn't, you know, there wasn't very many saguaros that survived this or Palo Verde. Um, something that's interesting about fires in the Sonoran Desert in the Arizona Upland subdivision of the Sonoran Desert is uh, the majority of the fires came in May, June, and July, and that's because that's our dry months. So uh, remember I talked about a bimodal or uh, bi-seasonal rain pattern. So when, there was, when there's rain during the winter, there, there's more production of annual vegetation. Um, the red brome, the bromus rubens, along with the native vegetation. So that's when it first dries out in May is uh, when we see most of the fires and then of course we don't see summer rains until sometimes late July. In late July we see the fires almost stop in the Sonoran Desert because we would have these monsoons and the uh, relative humidity would be higher and there'd be less chance that fires would carry. Okay. So this is something that's also interesting is that in, in the, the Tano National Forest part of the Sonoran Desert, 75% uh, of these, those fires were person caused from 1955 to year 2000. Uh, and only 25% were lightning caused. Very interesting. So it tells you that you probably could avoid um, the majority of those fires. So most of them were started by campfires, um, as, uh, thrown cigarettes from the vehicles along the highway right away because the more, majority of them were along highway right of ways or, the, or burning cars and then uh, you know uh, the chains bouncing creating a spark. Okay so I appreciate your time and if you have any questions about the uh, world deserts and the Sonoran Desert send me an email. Thank you very much.